Hey, what's up, guys? Uh, this is Alex Baker coming at you with Chris Randone. Uh, mm, really, what's up, my man? What's up? Really excited to have you on the <laughs> team, and so honored to be on uh, your uh, first video with you. So, uh, if you you might have seen Chris's face before, a very familiar face, if you've watched any of the <laughs> Bachelor franchise. So, do you want to kind of explain uh, your involvement with that? <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, for those of you who don't know. I was once upon a time on a show or two on ABC, uh, The Bachelor and uh, Bachelor in Paradise. But before that, uh, I've been playing daily fantasy sports for about four or five years now. Uh, have some great success uh, throughout the years. Have taken down some big tournaments, and uh, now have had the ability to join uh, Alex and the Osmo team, and uh, very excited. Yeah, excited to have you here. I mean, you're. A very a very talented guy, not only just in DFS, <laughs> but uh, your screen presence, of course. But also, uh, Chris has a background in doing a lot of the business stuff, so he's going to be helping us with the marketing and everything, so it's going to be really cool. But today we're going to talk about stacking. Uh, so, very popular strategy depending on the sport. Chris, do you want to explain uh, to everyone what stacking is? Yeah, uh, I mean, stacking, uh, basically what how it sounds is... Uh, compiling a, a group of players on a certain team and uh, putting them together to formulate uh, a stack against the pitcher. Um, stacking is probably the most prevalent type of strategy in MLB. Um, it's pretty simple. Uh, you stack a team, and whether you're on FanDuel or DraftKings, uh, you could have four on one team or you could have five, depending upon which site. But uh, the goal is to really expect to score a lot of runs uh, based on either a good offense, a good run implied total, um, going against a terrible pitcher, and you're just trying to optimize the potential uh, of your team. Absolutely. I think every baseball fan uh, has seen those games where it just turns into like 15 to 4 and whatnot, and then the positional players start coming out in, in relief, and that's when you know you're going you're gonna to win big if you have that team. Yeah, I mean, and, and it, it's also, it, the, it's such a difference when you're stacking compared to just choosing one player from a team. Because, um, I mean, you're needing so many different factors to take place from all those different games rather than just having one game and a group of individuals that are all playing together to really increase your odds of getting points in any way possible. Definitely. And uh, one of the fun things about stacking is that the probability of each team being the team to stack on a given day is pretty low. Uh, really good teams might approach like 10%, 15% on a big slate, but that allows, if you're multi-entering, you get exposure to a lot of different teams, so you can be sure that one of your squads is going to have a lot of success on a given day. Yeah, and, and I think it's also important that when, you, when you're stacking, to really get all different pieces of that lineup. Uh, I've been in situations before where I projected a team to really score a lot of runs, and I only stuck with four hitters. However, it was the other five hitters that end up dominating. And those types of variables really matter when stacking, and, and having those multi-entries are important. So stacking kind of works more in your favor so where you're getting a lot of different bits and pieces around that entire team and not just a selective few. Definitely. I think uh, anyone who's been watching baseball knows you never know which guy on the team is going to have the big day. Recently, uh, I remember yesterday, it was uh, the Angels out of the nine hole. Tommy Lestella hit like two home runs. And if you didn't have them, yeah. you weren't going to win. So it's like if you, if you don't stack, you're not going to have exposure to those guys at the bottom of the order that have the potential to, to kill it if the team gets a lot of uh, at-bats. And I know what's interesting is a lot of people tend to shy away from batters in those spots, like the 7, 8, and 9 hole, uh, primarily because they don't have as much projected opportunity as maybe, say, a 1, 2, 3, 4 hitter. They might not see as many as bats as well. However, though those are key spots that you can really hone in on that might have a lower ownership percentage and could really increase the odds of your stack taking something down. Um, I think another cool thing also in regards to that is uh, doing the wraparound where you can do like the eight, nine, one, two, or the seven, eight, nine, one. 
all these different combinations are interesting and very strategic when it comes to stacking in, in MLB. Absolutely. If you get those guys that come up to bat after each other, then you get the bonus for both the run and the RBI. That yeah. adds up pretty quick. Yeah. So, and then you also sometimes get those guys in like the eight nine hole, like uh, Billy Hamilton or Terrence Gore, who have a lot of stolen base upside, mm -hmm. and uh, just those little key factors play a huge role in separating yourself from either taking down a tournament or just coming up shy. Absolutely, if they can ever get on base, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's the that's the tough part. But hey, you know it happens. It does, and Billy Hamilton is known for winning some GPPs. So uh, let's uh, go through our process a little bit. We're going to be yeah. using Fancy Cruncher. First thing I'm going to do is upload my projections to Cruncher. So okay. um, I just went to the, the page on our site with the projections, copy, paste, and we're good to go. So and what's nice about that is, is you get the best of both worlds. It's You get the Fantasy Cruncher projections, you get your projections as far as Osmo's projections, and then you have your own projections as well. So if you want to talk about really gauging and measuring kind of where your projections are at compared to the software or, or Osmo, it, it's kind of nice to get that kind of clarity on if you're either doing the right analysis or if you're somewhere where you need to kind of uh, make improvements. Absolutely. I think that's a great point that you want to look at a variety, a variety of different projections because there's no perfect system other than mine. But uh, yeah, so uh, one thing I like to do is upload the projections and set my stacks and just crunch without setting any settings. And then we'll mm -hmm. see kind of if someone is just playing projections, what's going to be, what are the teams that are going to come up to the top of uh the crunches and those are going to be the most popular teams for the day usually so right as far as FanDuel stacks what kind of stacking schemes do you like to employ um as far as FanDuel, i'll go with a lot of four four um four from one team four for another and then making sure obviously the pitcher is not on either of those teams um four three one is another one of my favorites and we can kind of go into that when the when the time is right here um I also do sometimes 2-2-2, two, 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 but on rare occasions, and then sometimes I'll flirt with like a 4-2-2. Two, two. But primarily, I do like to have four from the same team regardless in any stack lineup that I have. Absolutely, yeah. It, it's really important that you have four from the team that scores the most runs. So that's going to be a big key to winning, and usually there's going to be at least one team on a bigger slate that that has a lot of runs, like 10 plus. And today we have 14 teams, so there's an even bigger chance. So I just set the uh, stacks to 4-4, four, four, and I'm just gonna crunch. And uh, what we're seeing, uh, unsurprisingly, is uh, one of the teams that's popping up to the top is Colorado at home. Coors Field, obviously, a lot of run production. And then uh, another is the Angels, and they're going up against Baltimore, a team with really terrible pitching. So um, what I'm gathering from this, like these are going to be our chalk stacks of the day. And you want to make sure your lineup has a balance of chalk and uh, a contrarian. So if you're going to go with the Angels or the Rockies, you need to balance it out by picking some contra like a contrarian stack as your second stack. Or maybe you go contrary to pitcher and go for a guy that no one else has. So one thing I like to do when I'm in Cruncher, um, this kind of sets the tone for me outside of seeing the Osmo projections as well, is seeing kind of where the chalk might be. And it's important because one, you don't want to have the same lineup as everyone else. And two, you want to know your opponents. You want to know kind of where everyone is, is thinking and uh, kind of be on the same page with them in regards to their lineups. Um, but one thing I do do is when I am in Cruncher and I do this process first to see where the chalk's at, I will take a chunk of this chalk and I will use those lineups. Um, it could be like 10 to 15 lineups. It all depends if I'm doing 100 to 150 max entry. And the reason why is because I do want a piece of the chalk just in case the chalk goes off. But then what I want to do after that is I want to now work my way down to being contrarian. And so then I'll take the two or three chalkiest stacks and I'll start lining them up with different 
stacks that I see have potential. And then I'll move my way down to really making it to where no one is probably on the same page as me and it's very low ownership, but yet holds a lot of upside, if that makes sense. Absolutely. You want to cover a lot of different possibilities and the chalk is the most likely possibility to score a high point total. Uh, it's also the one that has the most exposure to it. So you're kind of balancing those two factors and we have this tool on the site, the top stacks, and that kind of aggregates the ownership and the potential of every stack. So I'm going to look at, uh, for today, the Angels have a 15% chance of being the top stack on a FanDuel and a 15.9% aggregate ownership. So what kind of conclusion would you make about that? Uh, I mean, on a 14-game slate, 15% is relatively very high. Mm -hmm. um, so what that tells me is uh, Angels will be holding a lot of the ownership. They do have a great matchup. They are playing up against a not-so-great pitcher in a very favorable park that helps them. So, yeah, it does make sense to, to have some of that exposure to your own lineups. But it also lets you know that, okay, this could be an interesting – match up for yourself to fade as well um in in some cases to to go elsewhere because if if that stack fails you know that a huge percentage of the ownership in tournaments have failed as well yeah definitely i mean if it's 15 percent to be the top stack there's an 85 percent chance it's not but still the ownership is kind of in line with the potential so i think that makes it a pretty good stack to to deploy tonight so i think uh that's a good strategy uh, Colorado, we're seeing kind of similar numbers, 8% for top stack, but 8% ownership. So not as many people have it, but uh, it's not as likely to go off. So one thing I like to look right. at is kind of figure out where the biggest discrepancies are with these numbers. And what I'm seeing, Boston has a 9% chance of being the top stack by my calculations, but only 6% ownership. So that could be one we would target tonight. Yeah, um, one of the things I love doing and that I find very effective is I will go to the Osmo lineup setup where you're able to kind of grade your lineup. Now, I don't necessarily grade my lineups. What I do is I look at the ownership percentage that's correlated with the team and tie that in with the run implied total. So just like you mentioned, Boston Red Sox, they have a run implied total of six tonight at home, which is very high yet their ownership is relatively low as compared to, let's say, the Angels, who own a 15% ownership. And what that tells me is, is if a lot of people aren't on the Red Sox, but yet they're projected to score that many runs, which I believe is about second or third highest on the slate, that's an area that I potentially want to attack. And I really want to dive in deeper to figure out what stack correlations I could see being optimal and successful in this matchup. Definitely. I think uh, that's a great point. So look at the ownership of each player. We have it nicely laid out for you, for everyone. Uh, what I'm seeing is uh, the prices are pretty high at the top of the order. So we're seeing Mitch Moreland projected to be the fourth batter, but he's only 2% owned. And then Xander Bogarts, 4,200 on FanDuel today. Probably way more than his uh, potential for big games because he's not really... A uh, uh, home run hitter uh, as much as other guys, and he's only 1% on, so that kind of accounts for that. So if we see Boston score 10 to 12 runs or more, uh, Xander Bogarts and Mitch Moreland are going to be going up to the plate five to six times, and that's going to equal a lot of production, even though they aren't very high on. So, so what's interesting about this, too, is I want to point out if I really like the Red Sox tonight and I see a lot of opportunity there and it's low ownership and it really ties into my research and analysis, I will go back to Fantasy Cruncher and I will change the numbers to where I only am focused on Red Sox stacks and then I also figure out what pitchers I want to tie in with that and then I'll just let Fantasy Cruncher run its course for as many lineups that it can pull out of to see who can they pair up with as far as the Red Sox, how many different Red Sox correlations could I get? And is the pitcher that's assigned to that lineup someone I feel has potential for tonight? And that's kind of how I would do it um, when it comes to this type of scenario. Yeah, definitely. So that's a great point. We want to see Boston, they're quite expensive. So 
you might not be able to get the top pitcher of the slate, or you can't pair them with a really good stack. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to lock in Boston for stack one. I'm going to apply some randomness because I think uh, that that will give us some variety in the number in the different stacks that it pairs up with in the pitchers. And I'm going to uh, crunch here and. Uh, Fancy Cruncher has this nice tool where you can see what it's stacking with. And it looks like Boston and LA make a really, really strong stack tonight. Uh, in my crunch, I've set 25% randomness, which is pretty high. And LA is coming up 81% of the time as the second stack. Um, so actually, I might have to set the randomness higher to like see some different <laughs> different lines. Because from what, the, from what I'm seeing... If you stack Boston and LA, or if you stack LA and Colorado, there's going to be so many people on that combination that it's not going to be a great idea. So you want to pair it with some stacks that aren't quite as popular. Uh, so I'm going to I'm going to remove LA from this particular crunch and see what comes up. So what we're seeing is. Uh, well, I remove LA, Colorado comes up 60%. Toronto, Baltimore, White Sox. We're getting a good mix of them uh, as the second stack. So how would you go through and pick which one you want to enter as your uh, number one lineup? So one thing I would do, um, and this might be a little bit more detailed than someone else, but I like to take the stack that it brings me maybe like the top five to 10. And then I take those pieces that it gives me and I like to dig in a little deeper as far as the matchup, as far as um, the individual uh, scenario. And that allows me to go ahead and really break down uh, which one of these lineups has the most potential. And then can I use all 10? Can I use a couple? And that also helps me gauge also if it's low ownership, uh, maybe I wanna add a little bit more uh, as far as lineups are concerned, because not many people are going to tend to have the same lineup or somewhere close to really increase my odds, essentially. Yeah, definitely. I think having uh, having some low ownership guys along with uh, more of the popular guys is a great strategy. And uh, with this crunch, we're getting about uh, 15 different teams you can pair Boston with. So, um in general, I think you want your laps to be a little bit different from each other if they're going in the same tournament, and this will kind of give you that variety and exposure so we can go with a, a couple Colorado lineups, a couple Baltimore lineups with our Boston stacks. Right, and, and, and the reason being also is because it's such a large slate. So being a 14-game slate tonight, you kind of want to pair it up with multiple teams if that's the direction you want to go because there's so much opportunity out there and there's so many teams to choose from you don't want to limit yourself now i would say if this was more of a four or five game slate you it, it would be a completely um different approach in my opinion definitely so how would your approach change based on the slate size um on the slate size if it was down to four or five i would take boston and then i would pair it up percentage wise with every other team and then i would change up the players within boston and then do the same approach with every other team. And then I would eliminate a majority of low projected players and just try to create maybe 25 to 30 of the highest probable uh, line of projections possible. And then also what I do is I would limit my pitching exposure as far as to only maybe two to three pitchers and um, really create maybe the 50 to the top 100 lineups I could if, if I truly feel Boston uh, is the most highest projected and they're going to be very low owned on a, on a, on a five game slate like that, that's that, that would be the direction that I would go. Yeah. So it's like, you got to mix up your lineups, like having different pitchers in there, mixing it with different stacks. And also, as you're saying, taking guys, uh, different sets of four guys from the, uh, from the team. That, those are all different ways you can do it. Uh, I'm going to yeah. explain one strategy, uh, for crunching the, to get some different kinds of lineups. Uh, in general, what's your approach so that all your lineups are appropriately differentiated in Cruncher? Um, in regards to how, how do the lineups differ in the Cruncher? 
Yeah, just so you get like a variety of different players in your lineups. Oh, um, one thing I do is if I'm doing a 4-3-1 stack, um, I will look at my one-off page and see the top five to ten one-offs that um, I feel have a lot of potential. And I will actually run a few lineups in Cruncher with the actual lock button um, that makes sure that that one-off is in every single lineup. And then I get my 4-3-1 stacks accordingly. Um, so that's one thing that I do to make sure that each one is different. And then another thing that I will do is I will um, take out some players that have already seen come up in a lot of lineups. So let's just say Jackie Bradley Jr. and Sandy Leon have shown up in every lineup. I will eliminate them from the player pool and go ahead and do another 10, 15 lineups to see exactly what Fantasy Cruncher has formulated with those guys, with those guys taken out because clearly I don't want to have them in every single stack. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, that's a great strategy if you have time to really put a lot of detailed thought into your crunches. So I'm going to uh, give one strategy that will speed up kind of just getting a variety of different guys. What I did is I downloaded the projections and I uh, created a new column for exposure for each player. And mm -hmm. uh, what I set it to for this slate is one times the projection. So it's just the same okay. as a projection. And uh, I guess you can do that by just copy, copy pasting uh, in Cruncher too. Uh, yeah. So what I'm, what I'm doing here is that will limit the amount each player is in the lineup. So right now, Mike Trout has a projection of 19. So that means he will only be in 20% of the lineups generated. And that will give you uh, a pretty wide range of teams that come out uh, when you when you crunch. Yep, randomness is a is a really effective tool because uh, it helps not only make your lineups different, but it'll sometimes pull players that will make you think because maybe they didn't come up in your recent projections or they weren't someone on your radar. And I've seen countless times randomness bring in that player uh, that really kind of changes the difference in a tournament outcome as far as taking down something or, or uh, increasing your team's potential. Yeah. Um, what, what, one, one example, uh, not too long ago, uh, it was Cedric Mullins from Baltimore. Would have never looked at him ever, and Cruncher just kept pulling him up in randomness like nonstop, and I, I figured, okay, well, we have to fire a couple lineups with him in it. I mean, it just doesn't make sense to not play him. And he ended up having like 30 points, I think. And he was a, he was a min price person. Yeah, that's awesome. It's kind of uh, creates these combinations you might not get if you don't uh, apply some randomness. So it's good to have a little bit of exposure to those guys that are long shots, like the Cedric Mullins, Tommy LaStella. Uh, Tommy LaStella. Yeah, because that 1% guy, that guy can win you a tournament. So yeah. um, when, I, when I took this uh, approach, what I'm seeing is we're getting 35% Colorado sacks. 31% LA, and then a lot of teams in the uh, 5 to 15 range. So when you when you have this many lineups, what is your approach for selecting the ones you want to then enter in a tournament? Um, I for sure want to have exposure to the, the two highest percentage ones, absolutely. And I want to create a different couple combinations with the lower tiered percentage stacks with those high percentage stacks. But then I also want to play around with the, the middle tier and the lower tier stacks as well. So I, I want to have bits and pieces of everything. And I want to make sure that I'm covering all areas that um, I feel comfortable with going into the slate to make sure that I have enough exposure to, to make me feel confident going into that slate. Absolutely. So do you usually go through the lineups in Fancy Cruncher? Or do you like download them and uh, go through them in Excel or how do you how do you approach that? So I'll download them and then put them in Excel. Right. And then I have my own Excel spreadsheet with my projections and then I'll kind of compare the two. But then also uh, I like to take a, a nice chunk of what I've crunched and uh, go ahead and play with those lineups as well. So there will be about 25 to 30 lineups that I just do straight off cruncher um, and really see kind of that process and, and see the outcome. And I also like to compare that outcome to 
like 25, 30 lineups of my own process as well. And it really gives you a good understanding of knowing how to use Cruncher more and, and understanding why Cruncher is choosing these players as compared to your own analysis. Absolutely. So I think uh, there's a lot of different ways to kind of tackle this. Uh, Fancy Cruncher allows you to sort uh, in a few different ways, but usually the way I'll sort it is by my projections. And then uh, what you can do, uh, deselect all the lineups, and then um, you can click these check marks and then export, and those will be the lineups in your in your uh, CSV. And then you can just you can uh, take your entries file and paste them in. I think that that's an easy way to do it in Cruncher. Uh, if you're a more sophisticated player, you can do what Chris does and download all the lineups and kind of use uh, your Excel prowess to sift through them and figure out which ones you want to enter. Another cool thing you can do is when you've uh, crunched a certain amount of lineups and let's just say you like seven of the eight hitters, but you want to change something up with one. I mean, they have that quick player replace where uh, it's nice or you could lock other players and then recrunch to have it generate a different player as well. So you don't have to always go with that lineup that Cruncher gives you. If you want to make a small tweak or an adjustment, you can do it almost instantaneously. Yeah, I think that's a, a really good point. Uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to take Mike Trout out because what are the chances that guy has a good game, right? I'm going to just yeah. swap him from Cole Calhoun. So you can kind of uh, you can kind of tweak your lineups here uh, on the on the page, and that's uh. Uh, one one tool they also have on uh, DraftKings in particular is the wave swap feature. So if one of your guys gets scratched, then you can just go through all your lineups and uh, take them out and put some, put a, re-optimize and get get a lineup that has all guys that are playing. So that that's a pretty handy tool. Like I'm getting a bunch of show Otani, and I mean like I just ran 50 lineups and 48 lineups had Otani. Mm-hmm. So clearly I don't want to have 48 Otanis out of. 50 because that's 96 percent so i'll take him out and then i'll recrunch like 10 or 15 lineups to see what type of adjustment cruncher made and also see if it changed the lineup any different outside of just replacing otani yeah definitely i think uh whenever you take a player out it kind of changes all the salaries that fantasy cruncher is working with gives you a different mix one good way you can do that is uh if you if you're getting too much of a player in your crunch you can go back to the players list and I'll find Otani and uh, you can just change this exposure. Uh, so if I say I only want Otani in 25% of my lineups, so if I set his exposure to 25, uh, then in 75% of the lineups, uh, Fancy Cruncher is not going to have him in the player pool and that kind of gives you that mix you want. Right. All right, so uh, kind of went through all the basics. Uh, just give you guys some tips uh, that you can easily apply. I think on the big slates, you want to stack more. 4-4 uh, four, four stacks are uh, pretty good on a 13-game slate. If it's down to 8 games, 5 games, maybe 4-3. Or uh, if you're really uh, spending a lot of time, you can figure out two teams that you can't easily stack. For example... On FanDuel, they have pretty rigid positions. So maybe you find two teams where no player is a shortstop. And then all the people stacking 4-4 aren't going to have that combination. And you can figure out, well, because of that, it's going to be a little bit lesser owned. Uh, so that's one trick that I have that you can really gain an edge over the field. Mm-hmm. So um, kind of went through all the basics here. Uh, any final tips here? Uh, no, uh, I think, uh, just really understanding the effectiveness of stacking, um, is, is key to helping you increase the opportunity of taking down, uh, the big tournament we all dream of. Um, I mean, when a stack goes off, it, you have to understand it's a beautiful thing because hit after hit with points for RBIs or home runs, uh, on the same play happens a lot. Um, you know, for example, bases loaded. Uh, you have Jose Martinez, and then you have Dijon and Carpenter and Goldschmidt all on base, and you have that whole stack. I mean, you're not just scoring 30 points with a grand slam from Martinez. You're scoring an additional nine 
from each run that scored uh, from the players on base. So it's just really if you if you want high scores, uh, stacking is going to be the option that helps you achieve that goal. And just one uh, additional point to what you're saying, if you only have two of those three guys, then someone else is going to have three of them. And that's going to put you at a big disadvantage, uh, potentially. If like um, if you stack three guys from a team and they're the best team, then all the teams that have four guys from that team are likely to outscore you. So that's a good reason for going for the max. Yeah, I mean, how many times have we been in tournaments – uh, maybe previously in our daily fantasy sports career where uh, you have one player on one team and bases are loaded and he hits a grand slam and you think you're going to get first, but instead you get you get passed up by like five other teams because they had more than one player from that team. Man, I think you just triggered us off. <laughs> <laughs> really hitting that emotional core right now. Yeah, I think that that's funny because it's like you never know exactly what the sweat is. Maybe your sweat is uh, you have the guy and like they do well and you go down. That's why you need that stack so that it doesn't happen. No, it, it's it's just it's unreal how the sweats. You you think you have the player that's gonna take it down and he does what he needs to do and then you all of a sudden you drop instead of actually moving up. It's like what the hell just happened? <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah, so I think uh, you in general you want to get the max. The advantage of not taking the max players that you can from a team is that you get flexibility with the uh, salary. So maybe you can't get Scherzer if you have four Boston, four LA tonight. Uh, but uh, if you have four, uh, three Boston and four LA, you can squeeze them in with like a min price player. So I think that's uh, that's advantage. And, and Chris, one last thing. I know that you've uh, you've hand built a lot of lineups in the past. You were telling me that a lot of nights you uh, hand build forty lineups. So how yeah. does your process when you're doing that compare to when you've integrated Fancy Cruncher into your process? I can honestly say that I do not hand build anymore. Uh, it's officially over, <laughs> uh, especially. But I'll tell you this: I have now increased my entries. Uh, I used to do like 40, 50, and now I'm starting to get into like the 100, 150 max uh, simply because of the automation. Uh, the time that I'm spending it has been cut down drastically, uh, placing lineups into FanDuel, and that has allowed me to look at more extensive research or more analysis or it just gives me more time in my life in general. So, yeah, uh, hand building, great. It's fun. However, though, uh, the time in our generation automation is where it's at and uh really happy to have a tool that uh allows the work to be done for me uh and really cut down my time yeah absolutely i think uh a lot of people hand build there's a misconception that uh i mean you can put a lot of thought into each lineup if you hand build but if you set up the if you set the settings correctly fancy cruncher has so much uh uh, customization that you can you can take the algorithms that you're already doing in your brain and applying on the lineups page to fantasy cruncher and then you can speed up uh, the process a lot and i think uh, one underrated component of this is that uh, the lower buy-in tournaments are a little bit easier to win at than higher buy-ins so if you can take that uh 25 dollar grand slam entry and change it into five squeeze entries uh I think that uh, will have a great impact on your results. And also, I think it's more fun to make more lineups because you have a better shot of winning on any given night. Yeah. And um, to tell you the truth, hand building, uh, it also affects you psychologically when you're hand building lineups. And then all of a sudden, there's a change or you see a different player or something interferes with that actual lineup. I've, I've done it many times, but now with just importing, and exporting, uh, I don't have to see each lineup one by one. It's just going all in at once. And that also helps me with the mental approach to this as well. Awesome. Chris, really great to have you on the video here. Um, uh, look, uh, look for our other Fancy Cruncher videos that are going to be coming out soon. We're going to cover topics like randomness, like ownership, and how to use Fancy Cruncher. 
to cover all the bases. So, uh, yeah. yeah, thanks everyone for watching. Yeah, thanks guys.